All right, good morning, folks, and welcome to Friday Chalk Talk. And most importantly, happy first day of Nurses Week. This single handedly the most important people here within our healthcare system. Thank you. You're welcome, Sandy. <laughs> Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, who also is one of our show's co-hosts, Kristen Matheson. Kristen is currently a chaplain with Ascension, working at St. Joe's Hospital in Milwaukee. Um, and today's topic is going to be on spiritual bypassing, which is a, a type of avoidance mechanism that's really relevant, I think, to all of our daily practice here in palliative care and perhaps even in ourselves. And so our format for today is gonna to be two parts. The first will be 15, 20 minutes of presentation followed by some time at the end for some questions. And so with that, thank you guys all for being here with us today. And Kristen, I will hand the mic over to you. Thank you, Marty. Good morning, everybody. I'm excited to dive into this topic with you. Spirituality and religion play an important role in our work and for many of us, our daily lives. For the purposes of this conversation, I'll refer to spirituality and religion interchangeably because of how these phenomena overlap. They connect us to a transcendent reality which gives meaning to our lives and they connect us to our community or the entirety of the human race. Our spiritual and religious beliefs motivate social action and they supply rituals that organize and inspire important emotions like hope, contentment. One recent poll suggests that 77% of Americans identify with a particular religion. Of the 23% who don't, a substantial portion of them still engage in spiritual practices or identify religion as important. These numbers increase when we look at hospitalized patients, with one study indicating over 90% say they'd like spiritual support during their stay. The philosophy and practice of palliative care pays careful attention to this reality. We inquire about and integrate a patient or family member's religious beliefs into goals of care, following research that suggests a strong connection between spirituality and well being. But, and this is a big but, we've all seen when spirituality doesn't seem to help. The patient in pain calling out, God, why are you doing this to me? What did I do to deserve this? The family's demands for medically futile interventions or resistance to palliative measures, citing their belief in miracles. The cliched responses that hurt more than heal, like everything happens for a reason, or God won't give you more than you can handle, or when God closes a door, he opens a window. Today, we're going to discuss spirituality gone wrong. More specifically, we'll examine when our beliefs and practices serve not to connect us to something greater, but to instead disconnect us from what is closest to us, ourselves. This negative form of religious coping is called spiritual bypassing. And we will begin here with a humorous analog. Marty, do interject if you cannot hear the sound. Serenity now! Serenity now! What is that? Doctor gave me a relaxation cassette. When my blood pressure gets too high, the man on the tape tells me to say, Serenity now! What happened to you, pal? Joey Sanfino and some of the neighborhood kids, they ambushed me with a box of great A's. Are you all right? Oh, no, not fine, fine. Serenity now. Serenity now, serenity now. So you're using Frank's relaxation method? Jerry, the anger, it just melts right off. Serenity now. <laughs> Serenity now. Oh. Hey, what happened to you? Serenity. Serenity now thing doesn't work. Just bottles up the anger and then eventually you blow. What do you know? You were in the nut house. What do you think put me there? I heard they found a family in your freezer. Serenity now. Insanity later. What happened here, Kramer? Serenity now, serenity now. Kramer! Jerry, I didn't hear you come in. 
Uh, yeah, the uh, yeah, the children. They've 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 done some redecorating. <laughs> you don't look well, huh? Oh, well, that's odd because I feel perfectly at peace with the world. That aches you. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Look at me. I stepped on your last rose. <sighs> Jerry, come on. Don't get so upset about it. There's always next spring. Would you excuse me for a moment? Serenity now! Barry, I got it! <laughs> I beat Braun! One of those stupid rubber balls to get your stress out. Why did you have to destroy 25 computers? George, you listen to me. I owe you one. <laughs> All right, keep this video in mind as we proceed. Um, let's see. Okay. So spiritual bypassing is a term first coined by John Wellwood in 1984, who saw within his Buddhist communities a temptation for those who struggle to navigate through life's basic developmental stages to use their spiritual practices to suppress more fundamental personal needs. The term later got picked up by Charles Whitfield in the recovery literature to talk about how recovering addicts might avoid or bypass the psychological work involved in recovery by leaping directly to spirituality. Today, spiritual bypassing is commonly defined as a defensive psychological posture cultivated by a tendency to privilege or exaggerate spiritual beliefs, emotions, or experiences over and against psychological needs, creating a means of avoiding or bypassing difficult emotions or experiences. A key component to spiritual bypass is psychological avoidance. We all do this. Maybe we procrastinate, as Marty discerned I do earlier, or cancel plans at the last minute. Maybe we avoid eye contact or use drugs or alcohol or food to escape unpleasant emotions. And for patients with serious illness or family members with difficult decisions to make, it's not surprising that they may want to alleviate the emotional pain they're in. It's also not surprising that they might turn to what is most familiar to them to find ways around that pain. The second component to spiritual bypassing is spiritualizing. I'll give an example of this. I once worked for a nonprofit that had four locations. Millions of dollars had been invested in one of its sites. They got a brand new building and had plans for expansion. The other sites didn't receive this same attention. One in particular was housed in a decrepit building that was legally inhabitable, but paint was chipping off walls and the water supply was contaminated enough that no one would drink from it. The staff at this site implored the president of the organization to direct some funds to building improvements. And her response was, I've prayed about this matter and I believe it would be out of obedience to do so at this time. Rather than give a financial reason or an explanation rooted in the organization's strategic plan, the president appealed to her own impenetrable spirituality. Spiritual bypassing does something similar with our personal trauma histories, relational conflicts, and emotional pain. And the results can be tragic. Researchers Picciotto, Felix, and Nito include as consequences of spiritual bypassing the need to excessively control others and oneself, shame, anxiety, dichotomous thinking, emotional confusion, exaggerated tolerance of inappropriate behavior, codependence and compulsive kindness, obsession or addiction, spiritual narcissism, blind allegiance to charismatic leaders, and disregard for personal responsibility. It's worth pausing to note that most those most likely to engage in spiritual bypassing are those who identify as spiritual. When I talk with chaplains, I like to say, we've all done this, might even be doing it right now. And I share this with you because I've met many palliative care practitioners who are deeply spiritual people or who have a strong sense of calling to their profession. So as I begin to talk about the anatomy of spiritual bypassing, I invite you to consider not only how this might appear in patients and families, 
but also how it might touch on matters in your own life. Let's dive deeper. What causes spiritual bypassing? What does it look like when it's happening? What treatment options are available? One recent study explored spiritual bypassing from the perspective of those who identified as having engaged in spiritual bypassing in the past and were now recovering and being more conscious of it. These participants identified four causes, which might be boiled down to pain avoidance and the influence of spiritual leaders. People who engage in spiritual bypassing do so not just because pain hurts, duh, but because their larger social context collectively avoids pain. There's no room for them to go, no shared practices available to express their grief, no guidance from spiritual teachers on what concretely can be done to live into and through their hurt. In the dominant American culture example, for example, one that has been shaped by and very much shapes religion, we see a nearly manic obsession with happiness. It appears in various disguises. Buzz, buzzwords like mindfulness and empowerment might be its contemporary synonyms. These are not bad words or ideas. In fact, there's a lot of utility to them, but their popular form can stimulate confusion and insecurity in the unmindful and the disempowered. If there's no room for the unpleasant emotions we feel, they will, take, they will seek temporary housing somewhere else. Spiritual bypassing can be that somewhere. It looks like anger phobia. One participant observed that they viewed anger as an inappropriate emotion for spiritually advanced people. This led to social isolation, disconnecting from unspiritual people who are angry or who provoke uncomfortable emotions in the bypasser and what Robert Masters describes as premature forgiveness. Masters notes that often when people have been wronged or traumatized, natural feelings of anger and hate emerge. Religious people may suppress those feelings out of a sense of obedience to God or a desire to be enlightened, but anger demands its expression until it can walk with us into our grief. He writes, if we allow ourselves to express these feelings in an appropriate setting, like with a skilled therapist, we will sooner or later, not just break down, but break open until we are grief incarnate, making room for our woundedness without being overrun or governed by it. This of course takes time, but not nearly as much time as when we let our hatred out partially or only in ways that reinforce it so that it festers and feeds upon itself. I like to share my personal example of how spiritual bypassing led to <clears throat> premature forgiveness and developmental disruption. In college, I started dating a guy, we fell in love, and he expressed his desire to marry me to my parents. I should also clarify for the sake of this story, I went to a Bible college where people get married very young and where every aspect of your life is ordered by religious ideas, including how much TV you should watch and what you should wear. I'll never forget this. At the beginning of the week, this, this boy was telling me how much he loved me. And on Friday of that same week, out of the blue, he broke up with me and told me he had no romantic feelings for me anymore. And he did not want to get those feelings back. No explanation, no closure. I was heartbroken. I also had no real place in my worldview for anger. I spent the weekend crying my eyes out. And then on Monday, in typical Kristen fashion, I waltzed into my theology professor's office to ask for book recommendations on forgiveness. Rather than deal with the anger, I spiritualized my experience and it significantly impacted my ability to heal and move on. I remained attached to my pain for several years, ended up on antidepressants and didn't date again for five years following that breakup. It's a long time. Anger can be directed outwardly, but it can also turn inward and be experienced as piercing regret, a regret that must be felt if it is to be healed. I had one patient who was hospitalized for over a month due to an illness brought on by many years of smoking and alcohol use. And as he shared his story with me and noted the choices he made that contributed to his health condition, he said matter of factly, as the Lord says, you reap what you sow. This man was bright. And he had a strong knowledge of the Bible um, and showed it by interjecting scripture passages throughout his story. But what struck me was how sad he seemed. 
He had a religious framework to explain everything that was happening to him. So his need for meaning might be getting met, but he was also depressed. As we explored his proclamations of justice, you reap what you sow, we were also able to establish a discrepancy between his sense of justice and his belief in grace and love. New emotions emerged for him, tears flowed. It became clear that he had codified his regret into a kind of dogma. Participants in the study I mentioned earlier shared this patient's experience. They said that even as they sought safety in spiritual knowledge and spiritual superiority, they began to lose the capacity to love themselves. They felt shame. They also noted a propensity to avoid disappointment by refusing to create boundaries or confront people appropriately. For many spiritual and religious people, there exists not only a desire to be a good, kind person, but a desire to appear to be a good and kind person. This can lead to what Masters refers to as blind compassion. With blind compassion, he says, we don't know how to or won't learn how to say no with any real power, avoiding confrontation at all costs, and as a result, enabling unhealthy patterns to continue. Our yes is then anemic and impotent, devoid of the impact it could have if we were also able to access a clear, strong no that emanated from our core. Blind compassion confuses anger with aggression, forcefulness with violence, judgment with condemnation, and moral maturity with spiritual correctness. Fear of the consequences of being seen as mean, confusion about how to genuinely meet one's needs in the face of another's, and shame are all bypassed through appeals to the spiritual importance of love or the interconnectedness of humanity. Unhealthy transcendence is also a sign of spiritual bypassing and may be coupled with exaggerated optimism and spiritual narcissism. Those engaging in spiritual bypass seek to transcend their personal history rather than get intimate with it. The goal of transcendence in many spiritual traditions is to go beyond something in order to cease to identify with it so that it becomes an object of one's awareness, not so that it becomes something that can be bracketed off and denied. The spiritual bypasser may engage in meditation practices or appeal to theological beliefs that look similar to the ways a spiritually mature person may engage their faith, but the effect is emotional dissociation because they spiritualize in order to avoid pain. Finally, it's common for those engaging in spiritual bypass to blindly follow a religious leader. If their leader tells them that they will be healed if they have enough faith, they may work harder to prove that such faith exists. Recent studies have encouraged careful attention to the religious communities within which patients express their spirituality and find connection, for these may be, quote, a potentially powerful source of extra therapeutic sabotage or change. This overview of spiritual bypass would be incomplete without the gentle reminder that spiritual bypassing is a natural stage in a person's spiritual development. We can be compassionate towards this tendency in ourselves and others because it is an adaptive reaction to profoundly hard things in life. And because it does provide short-term benefits, it can give a person a sense of superiority, which can feel really good in the face of hurt, abuse, or shame. And it can provide temporary pain relief, which is important when that pain feels unmanageable. Eventually though, the spiritual highs run their course. Other parts of our lives deteriorate and the bypassing needs to be addressed. In the context of palliative care, addressing this issue will depend on many factors, including the amount of time we have with a patient and their family. There now exists a spiritual bypassing scale that I recommend to use informally with patients and I'll send along um, with some other resources. Phrases on the assessment include things like, when something tragic happens to me or others, I say that God will intervene or it is more important to me to seek spiritual guidance than to seek aid from a psychological helper. We might not ask patients to rate these phrases on a scale of one to four. We could observe, however, that patients and their families say things similar to this over the course of our interaction with them and can infer the presence of spiritual bypassing, particularly if other symptoms are present. 
When we assess a patient is spiritually bypassing, one path we can take is to use the basics of motivational interviewing to help them see the impact of spiritual bypass on their well being. There's a helpful article on this in the Journal of Counseling and Development, which I'll include in the bibliography I send. And in it, the authors detail a series of helpful um, steps that include exploring the patient's spiritual history with empathy and examining the patient's specific spiritual values with an emphasis on developing discrepancy between their values and spiritual bypass. It's important not to assume that we know a patient's values just because of their religious affiliation. So as those values become clearer to us, we can develop discrepancy to highlight a potential spiritual bypass issue, such as the way a patient may hold very good noble values, but use them in a way that stunts their personal growth or isolates them from others. Lastly, our own personal work with our shadow sides will help us engage those in spiritual bypassing with deeper compassion and effectiveness. When we become alert to the pain in our personal histories and acknowledge the variously effective and ineffective ways we attempted to cope with it, we become more alert to that which hovers under the surface of our patient's religious and spiritual speech and the gift we give them if we take the time to bear witness to that pain is movement towards a healthy spirituality that will indeed help sustain them through the difficulties that lie ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. That was wonderful. Um, we'll open it up for questions. If you have anything, feel free to unmute or even put your hand up. That would be fine. And while we give people a moment or two to consider what they'd like to ask you, I have um, a quick question and then a, a little bit longer one. So the first one is, are all chaplains trained to recognize and treat this such that if I, if, if, if maybe I recognize this or, or maybe if I think that somebody has this, I can get our chaplain involved or am I looking more at a, a therapist to help a social worker to help? How do, how do I help somebody try to get some motivational interviewing? Right. Um, I think if, I, it depends kind of on the setting. And I said something like timing of things. If um, a patient is diagnosed with a serious illness and has, you know, several months to live, I would recommend professional counseling for this sort of thing. And a counselor who's, um, who understands the role that spiritual spirituality plays. Um, I am not a trainer of chaplains. So I cannot say that all chaplains know about spiritual bypass. In my own training, I, I got to present on this and learn more about it, um, which was really fun. And I also think that chaplains are likely to engage in spiritual bypassing behaviors. <laughs> okay, um, sure. So if we're, if we're members of the team that are like really at risk in that, it, it then involves sort of the whole team um, to talk about what this patient's need is and to recognize that. I do think though, that um, if chaplains are very aware of this in their own histories, they could be incredibly effective partners um, with the patient. So that's Thank what you. I'll say about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thomas, did I see your hand was up? Hey, Marty and Kristen, thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, listening to what you're sharing, shared, uh, I have a little bit of a chill, chills kind of reaction mm. because I believe I've experienced some of the things you're describing, uh, but it's kind of a slippery experience for myself as it's uh, taking place. Uh, and I think there's a very similar question in the chat. Uh, I'm, even though I'm visual, for, this is something that I would probably want to maybe experience or be on video where you know, we do one run where let's do it the, the normal way. And then this is what's really happening. This is what you should be doing. Do you believe there's such a resource out there like where someone explores this and they have examples of what we normally do versus how do we apply what you just shared in clinical practice? And again, thank you for presenting. Yeah. Um, I don't know of a video. I do know of um, one of the articles I mentioned 
which um, applies motivational interviewing techniques to someone in spiritual bypass is um, particularly useful. So I'll, I'll send it to Marty and he can attach it um, in an email because it provides a case study of how this worked. Now, the case study is in um, more of a long-term therapeutic relationship, um, but it can at least get the wheels turning about how this works. I'll also say the research on spiritual bypass Thing is somewhat limited because the con one, the concept is newer and two, people didn't really start paying as much attention to it until recently. So there's um, some good material that's come out in the last maybe three years or so and a lot more work that needs to be done and, and I believe is being done. Thank you. Yeah. Kristen, if, if we or you, oh, Roberto, I see you you're unmuted. I'll have you go next, Roberto. I want to get one more quick question. In. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if, if we or you recognize this, I think we as a palliative care team may be more accepting in that being present with a patient, trying to help them work through this thing. What about how do you talk with the consulting service that you are recognizing this when they're um, are feeling pressure about length of stay or concern that the patient doesn't get it. Um, how do you talk to other, other specialties about this to help them appreciate what somebody's going through? Um, I always like to encourage people who feel very ur urgently that the family needs to make up their mind or change their mind or something, um, that a little bit of time and space can go a very long way. And I think that is what some of these people need. They're in intense pain. They're trying to cope with that in a way that in the long term won't be effective. Um, but I will, I will try to raise to people, this, this could be what's happening under the surface. This is what they're going through. What if instead of you know three different disciplines calling them four different times today to try to convince them to change their family member's code status to DNR. We um, give a little space, have one person, maybe a supportive team member give a call, listen to what they're going through, let them start to process it. It is amazing how when you give people a little bit of time, this often sorts itself out on their own, on its own. I think for patients that I've dealt with that um, are themselves in the hospital for longer and kind of battling through this, um, I haven't had maybe the same experience with interdisciplinary team members um, because they're not as in a rush to get that decision forward. Thank you. And I see Michelle is including some resources in the chat that I also have in a bibliography that we'll send out later. Roberto, my friend, sorry for intruding earlier. No, that's okay. I mean, I'm used to that, you know. So. Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. That's, I, <laughs> I just, I just want to thank you, uh, Kristen, because uh, you uh, give me uh, terminology to uh, to name what what I experience sometimes, and so uh, I, I a question was asked by Martin: Do we chaplains are we trained to? to recognize a spiritual way passing. I think we are, but also, I also think that with experience, you become a little better. I mean, whether you do exactly step one, two, three, four, or whatever. But I think, you know, the, 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 the key is, is, is really to, uh, we, sometimes we, we use it as a cliche that we need to learn to listen. And it's such a cliche, but I mean, it is really, that is really the key, I mean, to, to listen. I noticed that, I do better uh, at the beginning with those patients who are here for a long time. After a while, you know, I said, shit, what do I, you know, oh man, what am I gonna say? And sometimes the best I've done with these people is, uh, sometimes I go, it's just company because there is really nothing for me to say and they are not ready to talk, but just that, that company. And uh, eventually they do share, you know, that they do, they do spiritual engagement instead of, spiritual bypassing but you know I do uh early on you mentioned a phrase that I have heard 
And it is the thing about everything happens for a reason. I, do, I, I, I don't like that phrase, you know? I mean, uh, a lot of people say it and I, I encounter this, oh, Chaplain, but everything happens for a reason. Really? Shit happens. And then you pick up the pieces and it is in the way you respond that you do spiritual engaging. But I mean, shit happens. I mean, I, I, I mean, somebody dies. I mean, what, tell me, what is the reason for, I mean, in a tragedy, what is the reason for that? So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, happiness to you. <laughs> thank you, Roberto. All right. Thank you, Kristen. We're really lucky to have you with us today. Wonderful to be here. Thanks, Marty. You're welcome. Happy Friday, everybody. Have a great weekend. See you next week.